Hi, I'm Sean Stewart. I'm part of a Penn State Chemical Engineer 470 Team 11 Chemical Plant Design Team, which includes Aaron, Mario, Vinny, and myself. And this is our sugar cane to jet fuel conversion plant. Uh, our plant will be located in Hawaii. It is producing 185 million pounds per year of jet fuel, which we plan to make $82.6 million by assuming your sales price of $3 per gallon, and we can sell an ethanol side product for $7.5 million, selling it at a price of $1.42 per gallon. Uh, our list of IBL equipment includes six reactors, <laughs> including three fermentations, and five distillation columns. And now Benny will go over the PFD. Okay, so the inputs to our plant are gonna start at the mill. We're gonna be putting in about 200,000 pounds of sugar cane per hour into this mill. About half of that is gonna end up being water. A quarter of it will be sucrose, which is what we want, and the other quarter will be bagasse. Bagasse is just the fibrous material left over after milling sugar cane. We're gonna get rid of that. The sucrose will move on to the settling tank because unfortunately in the sugar cane there's a little bit of dirt and we need to get rid of that to keep up purity. After that, we're gonna move on to uh, a mixer because we need to add in some water. The water will become important in the fermentation process. The fermenters are the next step. They will be, they, uh, they're gonna convert the sucrose to the, our, uh, the next thing that we need. Um, it, it's gonna run at about 119 grams of sucrose per liter of water. Now the fermenters are gonna be run at 95 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And you'll notice that there are three fermenters. That's because of the bacteria that we chose to run in them. The bacteria that we chose, his name is Klebsiella XRM21. The residence time that they need, though, is 65 hours. So that's pretty long. And we have the three fermenters so that we can keep the entire process continuous. Um, after that, uh, the, will, the bacteria will convert 100% of the sucrose. 99% of it will become 2,3-butane diol, which is the product that we want, and the other 1% will become ethanol. After the fermenters, we have a holding tank. The holding tank can hold up to two and a half times of the size of one of the fermenters. That's there in case there's overflow and it's gonna take care of all the extra. Um, because each fermenter is gonna be run twice a week. Uh, there's about the, for 65 hours, like we said, and it's run uh, with 19 hours between each cycle. Because the residence time is so long, we need that to make sure that the fermenters are still doing well, purging off bacteria, and uh, loading in the uh, input and taking out the product. It takes about 27 hours for the, an entire fermenter to completely run through the whole process stream. After, after the storage tank, we move on to the mole sieve. Because there is so much excess water, in the uh, process stream due to the, what's needed for the fermenters. We need to get rid of it. The distillation proved way too costly because it was just so much water. So we used the mole sieve and it took off a lot of the water we didn't want and moved on the 2,3 uh, butane dial that we did want, which will go to the next reactor. Coming off the mole sieve, the next stop is the dehydration reactor. The dehydration reactor is a CSTR that's run at 356 degrees Fahrenheit and 156 uh, PSIA. Its residence time is about eight minutes. So we're going to be pumping in the 2,3-butane dial in hopes of converting it to butanone. Um, in order to do that, we need to pump in some sulfuric acid with that. So uh, the sulfuric acid will be at a molarity of about 1.9. So after the reaction, we have the yield of our product. The uh, reaction has a selectivity of about 91% of the butanone, which is the desired product, and the rest, uh, the undesired products are 2-methylpropanol and butadiene. After the reaction, they head on to the mixer to bring both ends of the reaction back together. Now, because the reaction had to be at such a high pressure, we had to bring down uh, the pressure for the rest of the process. So we have a valve to relieve that pressure. Now Aaron's going to go ahead and continue the process flow diagram.
The product of the dehydration reactor contains a mixture of butanone, which is also called methyl ethyl ketone, which is what we want, and also 2-methyl propanol, butadiene, and some unreacted sulfuric acid. This mixture is heated up and sent to the flash separator, um, which is run at 176 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is right above the boiling point of methyl ethyl ketone. Um, stream 15 coming out the bottom contains mostly uh, sulfuric acid and some hydrogen sulfate. So this stream is mixed with sodium hydroxide and M320 there and to neutralize it and then sent to waste. Um, the vapor stream coming out of the flash separator uh, is compressed to a liquid and then fed to the trimerization reactor at 338 degrees Fahrenheit and 19.7 PSI. The reactor has a residence time of 1.5 hours and performs the reaction shown at the bottom of the slide there. Um, it has a 99% conversion of the methyl ethyl ketone uh, and a 95 selectivity for the desirable product, which is shown in the bottom right there. Um, and that is called 3,5-diethyl-2,5-dimethyl cyclohex 2 ene one own also known as 3,5-keto. A heavier oligomer is also produced in the reaction as an unwanted byproduct. The stream from the reactor is then pumped to the first distillation column, which is T410 there, uh, which was designed to remove water and other lighter boiling impurities. Uh, these leave in stream 22 in the distillate as waste. Uh, the bottoms from the tower are then pumped into the second distillation column, which is T420 down there. Um, in this column, the heavier ligamers that were produced in the trimerization reactor are separated into the bottom stream, which then go to waste. Stream 25, which contains a concentrated feed of the 3,5 ketone, uh, is then cooled to 320 degrees Fahrenheit and then fed to the hydrodeoxygenation reactor, R500. Uh, this reactor, which is shown on the right side there, is a shell and tube reactor, um, and in this reactor a bifunctional niobium phosphate supported platinum catalyst performs the reaction shown at the bottom of the slide there, um, in which the 3,5 ketone is hydrogenated and then the carbonyl is removed and converted to water. The final jet fuel product is 1,3-diethyl-1,4-dimethylcyclohexane, which is shown right there. The vapor and liquid streams from the reactor are mixed and then sent to the first of three distillation columns to purify the final jet fuel product, um, the first column of which removes all of the water uh, in the distillate stream. The bottoms are then pumped to the second column, which is T520, uh, to remove the remaining heavy oligomers that were produced in the trimerization reactor, and those go out the bottom. The distillate from column T520 is then pumped to the final distillation column, which removes the remaining impurities. The final product, stream 32, contains 99.95% .95 jet fuel by mass and has a flow rate of about 22,000 pounds per hour. And then this stream is sent off to the OBL for storage. And now Mario is gonna talk about the economics of the jet fuel plant. Okay, to start off the economic analysis of the proposed project, we first generated a, a capital cost estimate. After further evaluation, the overall cost for the, t the jet fuel plant totaled in to be around $111 million. This calculation was based on a total plant capacity of 185 million pounds per year of jet fuel product with a primary sucrose feed coming in at a little over 46,000 pounds per hour. Since this project is constrained to Hawaii, an additional location factor of 1.1 had to be carried out through all the fixed costs to represent the additional logistical constraints and costs with this location. A majority of the IBL equipment was sized and costed via Aspen Icarus Economic Analyzer, while the remainder of the items, including the outside battery limit equipment, um, the mill, and all the reactors were estimated via direct vendor quotes. Um, additionally, an escalation of 3% per year and a plant contingency of 20% was also built in to the total plant cost of $110 million seen below. A quick look at it, this data um, shows that the two most expensive contributors to this fixed cost are the mill and the, fer the fermenters. There are additional ways to reduce cost here, like buying the sugar from an outside vendor instead of producing it in-house. Um, another way to cut costs would be to research a different type of bacteria or yeast strain that reduces the residence time needed for the fermentation reaction, which is why we have three fermenters instead of one, which increases costs. 
However, we chose that bacteria because of its excellent conversion, so there are trade-offs with any decision we make. So although the estimated after tax sales revenues uh, for the plant will cover these capital costs after only about two years, um, it does not represent many of the other operating and startup costs that will be discussed in the following section. So to get a better understanding of these more variable costs, we looked at three main areas, including the raw materials, the utility usage, and our labor and overhead. One point that stuck out to us is the large dependence on sugarcane that this process requires. It can be seen that sugar represents about 75% of the total raw materials cost. Considering that this plant design is not very capital intensive and relies heavily on the price of feed and product streams, a great deal of risk is introduced. Both the utilities and labor costs make up only about 20% of the total cash costs before a carbon credit was introduced, which also shows how dependent this design is on raw materials for profitability. Speaking of the necessary carbon credit, we found that this project will never have a positive net present worth without the intervention of government subsidies in the form of carbon credits. Therefore, we calculated the minimum carbon credit that would be needed just to break even over a 15-year project lifespan. This turned out to be $323 per ton of jet fuel produced annually. In other words, we would need about $22 million in government aid just to break even. So to build off this idea, we ran several sensitivity studies that showed the degree of risk associated with these six cost variables shown below. Basically how the sensitivity study was conducted, we created a base case and then for each category for feed prices, product prices, utility costs, fixed costs, plant capacity, and capital costs, we created a best case scenario and a worst case scenario to look at the spread between the necessary carbon credit. And as you can see with the two first categories of feed prices and carbon prices, the variance between the best case and the worst case is relatively large compared to the rest of them, indicating that this process is very price sensitive to both the price of jet fuel and the price of sugarcane. And next I'll transition off to Sean to finish up our team's final recommendations. Upon completion of the economic analysis for the base case, it was concluded that it would not be wise to move forward with this project. This design depends too much upon the stable oil markets and sugarcane supply to turn a profit with a minimum government subsidy. One area for improvement comes in the sugarcane milling process. It was decided to design the mill in-house and refine our own sucrose. However, this proved to be a rather costly venture and it may be better just to leave the sugarcane refining to the industry's experts and purchase the final product in bulk. Additionally, the other major way to mitigate risk in this project would be to explore alternative methods that require much lower sugarcane input. The extreme reliance on sugarcane prices really constrain the budget and ultimately this plant's ability to become profitable. So we can't really stress enough how unprofitable that this venture would be. The cost of jet fuel is just too low and sugarcane is just too high. But while you're still in Hawaii, we came up with some things that you could do to still have fun. You could go eat some seafood, like as Aaron said, some blowfish. Um, you could go surfing, you could go fishing, you could experience probably your first ever shark attack. Those are just some things. And hula dance. Hula dance? Oh yeah.